The innovation of the American culture lasted until about the early 1900s. The Industrial Revolution created a shift from an innovation type culture based on inventions, free market, to where you had huge corporate barons begin to partner with the government. Interests like Rockefeller, Carnegie, began to infiltrate the schools. It began to change the liberal education that people were used to into a type of training to be a cog in the industrial machine. 27 years ago, the Congress of the United States authorized the formation of a congressional investigating committee to try to analyze the functions of the great foundations in America, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, and the Ford Foundation for the congressional committee that came to be known as the Reese Committee. Mr. Dodd is an economist. He's a uh, consultant as far as investment is concerned. But during that period, that very important period some 27 years ago, he headed research in the effort to find out what indeed were the great foundations doing in America. Mr. Dodd, what did you find out was the stated objective and goals of the great American foundations? We found out, Doctor, that these foundations had as their objective the orientation of the people of this country to the idea of collectivism and uh, thereby nullifying for good and all uh, the commitment of the country to individualism, which was the feature of the country at the beginning. Now, how did they go about doing this? Well, primarily they did it, Doctor, by, uh, by uh, securing control of what is known as the money supply of the people of this country. You're speaking now of the money supply that was going into education. Well, it's the money supply of the, of the people of the country as a whole. And how did they do this? They did this by working out a system of banking, which was foreign in its concept, but it enabled it, debt to be what we call monetized, transformed into bank deposits. Now, how did they specifically set out to influence education in America? Why, by, by having at their disposal unlimited quantities of this newly created money and being able to reward uh, the personalities who were active in the world of education administratively as well as academically. Were they able to influence the textbooks or the teachers? Yes, they were. They were able to get, see that textbooks were almost produced by on order and assuring the publishers of textbooks of the funds necessary to make the publication of those books profitable. Now, have you personally had contact with some of the directors of these great foundations? Yes, I have. Could you tell us about it? Well, one instance, I'll use a, a couple of uh, instances as, as illustrations. One instance had to do with my responding to an invitation from the president of the Ford Foundation who asked me if, when I was next in New York, would I stop in their office and have a visit, which I did. And on arrival, after amenities, Mr. Gaither, who was the then president, said, Mr. Dodd, we invited you to come and see us this morning, hoping that you would, off the record, tell us why the Congress was interested in operations of foundations such as ours. And before I could think of how I would reply to him, he volunteered the following. He said, Mr. Dodd, those of us here at the policy-making level have all had experience, either with the OSS or the European Economic Administration, in operating under directives, the origin of which was the White House. We today operate under just such directives. Would you like to know what the substance of these directives is? And I said, yes, Mr. Gaither, I'd like very much to know. Whereupon he said to me, the substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union.